Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Thanks for uh, coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. No teaching today? You know, I am full-time research professor, so my my um, time consists of running research projects, conceiving research projects, building collaborations. Yeah. I have a group of students I manage, graduate students for yeah. in a variety of capacities, research assistants, postdocs, but I'm not teaching at present. Yeah. So mostly well, my time is really completely dedicated to research. That's amazing. How lucky are you? You know, I love it, actually. Uh, I know a lot of people love to teach, and I also love to be in the classroom and and share knowledge and teach, and I've had opportunities to do that. But my heart really lies in, um, in the research and advancing knowledge. So I, I mm -hmm. love it, actually, yeah. Uh, well, we appreciate it. So thank you. Um, do you also, so what drove you to do this? Like, are you also a practitioner? Were you a practitioner first or, or do you practice or is it just the research? Are you just interested in the topic? So I was about, I don't know, memory is a little vague, but I was in elementary school so probably third or fourth grade. And I would go to my grandmother's house after school. She lived next to the elementary school a few blocks away. And my parents were working and they said, just go to your grandma's house. You can walk there and we'll pick you up later in the afternoon. So I did that for years. And I would go to my grandmother's house and we would sit down, usually kind of ritual, sit down and debrief and have a little snack or juice or something. Uh -huh. And then she would take me up into this room on the second floor of her house, which is called the blue room because the walls were painted the sky blue, azure blue. And she would lead me through these different exercises uh, that were about <clears throat> largely calming the body, mm -hmm. distilling the mind, watching awareness and its fluctuations, and then imaginally conjuring new worlds, imaginal worlds, and visiting these worlds, participating in them. I don't know where she got these exercises, these yeah. visualizations. Uh -huh. I remember them vividly to this day. I think um, they had a profound impact on sort of who I am and how I've come to frame my own experience, how I've come to understand the importance of uh, the inner life, the interior richness of life, um, and the cultivation of, of consciousness through contemplation. So in that way, I was sort of introduced to meditation as a child, and she never called it meditation. She would just say, I, I you know, she would say, I'm going to guide you through these, you know, um, she was, I think she just called them guidances. We're going to, I'm going to, we're going to go through these imaginary guidances. And again, we'd also involve calming practices and the somewhat, um, observational practices of the mind for sure um but a lot of them were really imaginal visualization practices what i would call visualization so then as i got older let's say 12 13 <laughs> you know a little bit older and then i sort of you know certainly yeah six five fifth six seventh grade you know, I could read a little more. I could read a little more complex things. By the time you're in fifth, sixth grade, you can start to read stuff, you know, and more. So that by then I started to, um, uh, she had an incredible library and I would start to read the books in her library when I would go there. And then um, I started to build my own library of books I wanted to read. And my aunts had libraries and my uncles and um, so I was always reading and trying to figure out, um, what is, what are these practices? Where do they come from? 
Mm -hmm. And I was very interested in healing modalities at that point and practices for healing. So I was very interested in kind of, I was also a teenager, so I was very interested in martial arts, you yeah. know, Kung Fu and karate, and but then also like Tai Chi as and what is that? What is Chi? And so then studying that kind of thing, and and then of course you know meditation. Not really thinking of it in the kind of terms I do now, but having exposure to 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 reading, um, yeah, books throughout my teenage years um asian philosophy again a lot of asian medicine and healing i was really into like um the healing arts and 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 martial arts and um i was involved in that as a practitioner as well when i was a teenager and then by the time i got to college um you know it was like game over i realized okay no one's telling me, you know, I, I, well, not no one's, I, I realized I can study this full time. Yeah. I, like I can actually now go and do, you know, just read this material. Whereas in high school and all, I still had to take math class and science class and, you know, English, they're not teaching, you know, English, we're reading Shakespeare. We're not reading, you know, <laughs> Zen. <laughs> so I was like, ah. I can actually choose what I want to read and what I want to study and what I want to involve myself in. So I immediately went to the religious studies department and figured out like, um, you know, who's teaching this stuff and what classes are there. I took a freshman seminar called the Sacred Quest, which was this kind of. And where were you? I went to a very small school in Massachusetts called Wheaton College and a uh, small liberal arts college. But anyways, um, the point is that I, I realized I could study this and I yeah. um, then dedicated those four years just to basically reading Buddhist materials. And I sort of did, I created, a, a you know, my bachelor's degrees in religious studies and Asian studies. I have a dual major and a minor in psychology. There was a psychology professor there who was very interested in like Csikszentmihalyi and the psychology of flow and mindfulness was just, this was in the nineties, right? So mindfulness was just sort of trying to pick up speed in the psychological circuits with John Kabat-Zinn's books and so on and so forth. So all that was the zeitgeist in psychology and there was some, uh, one professor who was into that. So anyways, so that was that. And then, you know, anyways, on and on graduate school and so on and so forth, yeah. That's ex that's extraordinary. It was just handed to you. You had like your your grandma was like your first guru. They just yeah. So you asked me, am I a practitioner? I think yeah, I am a practitioner in the sense of not. So I was at this talk here at the University of Virginia the other day, yesterday, I guess. And my colleague, he was talking about um, the Bhagavad Gita, and he said. Uh, there's this one Indian scholar who says no one is born in India without knowing the Bhagavad Gita. Right? It's like if you're born in India, you just know the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> it's not quite like that for me, but I have to say that very yeah. young coming up, it was just part of my life and what you do. And it was encouraged and cultivated and not something that you do on the side. That's this you know, kind of compartmentalized exercise, but the contemplative life was just part of, you know, it's time to orient yourself, calm yourself, mm -hmm. watch your mind and body unfold, mm -hmm. and imagine new worlds. Yeah. And those were the kind of processes that I continue to be very involved in and, and now study in a more formalized manner. Yeah. That's really unbelievable. And you just sound like you had such a nice, like that's such a nice path. Like, so I did martial arts as a kid, but the, yeah. contem like the contemplative healing bits wasn't, weren't so much there. It was more the conflict side, the conflict resolution side, or I had to work later to come to the, oh, we can use a calm to mind. This is a good thing. Cause it was that I, I really, that's really interesting that you say, I don't come across that many people who's had that for them and provided for them like that for that you have at least not in 
in the West. And don't get me wrong, I, I mean, I love Bruce Lee, like, you know, the Bruce Lee, like, fanatic at one point, and I guess I still am. And, um, and, and, but also karate, Japanese forms of karate and so forth. And, but also, you know, like, just take Bruce Lee, for instance, he also had a philosophy, yeah. you know, um, and he was uh, someone who understood how movement, uh, poetic movement um, uh, can be articulated as a kind of philosophy. Yeah. And that it is about resistance and movement of flow and energetic kind of uh, manipulations in intentional ways. And that's very much resonant with the contemplative life, although, you know, it's not combative, of course. Um, so anyways, those were the kind of things that I was interested in and in, and in, and in, in finding resonance and analogs with. Yeah. So then I read in your bio that you spent an ex quite an extended amount of time in, in Tibet. Right. So after graduate school, so, you know, I went junior year abroad. I, went, I had to go to India. I was like, you know, by that, by the time I was 18, I was like infatuated by India. Like even by, um, I went to Japan when I was a teenager um, and I got deeply involved in Zen. I went to Kyoto and spent several weeks um, as a teenager on this exchange program in, in Japan, but mostly in Kyoto and Nara, and, which is very kind of deep Japanese culture place. And I still have a, a real connection. In fact, I was just there um, several months ago. I've been going back and I love that place and was deeply kind of um, that infused my early kind of uh, experience of Buddhism, Japanese culture. I got really into Zen, did a lot of Zen training in uh, my late teenage years, early 20 years. By the time I was an undergraduate, I had, um, as I was mentioning, I was studying, I just really wanted to study Buddhism at that point. And um, I remember being in the library of uh, college and just by myself, one of those things, I was taking a independent study in art and Buddhist art. Mm. And we were studying Himalayan art. Um, the professor was an expert in Nepalese art. Um, and there was one book, I, I remember this kind of, you know, oversized, colorful art book, and I opened it up, and uh, there was a picture of this deity there, and it was kind of close up of a fresco of a wall painting in Tibet. And um, I, at that moment, I remember it was like a pivotal moment for me of like, oh, that's what I've been looking for. <laughs> Like now all of my energies, I knew it was on the Buddhist track and it was on the meditative, but then it was like, ah, yes, these is my tradition. Mm -hmm. Like this are the, the, this is the aesthetic. This is the presence. This is um, the, the, the wakeful quality that I um, uh, want to pursue. So at that moment, I sort of kind of completely was just interested in Tibetan Buddhism. It was probably my freshman or sophomore year, I don't remember. But so then I, I wanted to go to India, which again, I had this sort of bug for, but I went to Nepal, also Kathmandu, lived in Kathmandu um, for uh, six months when I was in, well, the whole thing about yeah nine months, I guess, um, and came back to the States and graduated and so forth. And then went back to India and just did pilgrimage in India for like a year and a half i just went to all the buddhist sites and just traveled mm. around all the buddhist sites i just wanted to do pilgrimage in india and at that time you know i was connected with tibetans at that time in india and really kind of learning the tibetan language but really kind of going to these buddhist pilgrimage sites with tibetans and in that community and so forth and um then it was you know i knew i wanted to go to graduate school so I had this kind of fortuitous um, connection with um, a man named Stephen Goodman, who uh, ended up becoming my 
PhD advisor. So there was a man named, a scholar named Herbert Gunther, Herbert V. Gunther, who was kind of one of the, in my mind, the pioneers of Tibetan studies, Tibetology, mm -hmm. the study of Tibetan Buddhism in the 20th century. He, he uh, published, uh, you know, starting uh, in 19, well, 1949 was, I think, his first book on translation, but through the 50s and 60s and 70s. And he had an incredible impact on me reading his books, the books of Gunther, and in particular, I was very interested in, in the Nyingma tradition and, and Dzogchen and Longchenpa, and there was a trilogy he did, he, Gunther translated called Kindly Bent to Ease Us, um, the blue, red, and silver, I actually have it over there on my bookshelf, um, which is a translation of this trilogy by uh, 14th century Tibetan Dzogchen uh, master and scholar, named Long Chempa. And um, that book was deeply uh, impacted me, but I couldn't really read Tibetan that well. I just sort of started to learn Tibetan. Mm -hmm. I came back uh, from India. I went to Columbia University just to study Tibetan and study, started studying Tibetan at Columbia to, to really get my academic chops up and uh, my language chops. And then I met Stephen Goodman, and he was one of three people who received the PhD from Herbert Gunther. Gunther only allowed three people to ever receive a PhD from him. It was really intense um, mentor. And uh, of those three, only one of them had gone on to teach at the graduate level and teach in well to go into academia. And that was Stephen Goodman. And so when I learned that and I met Stephen, I, I, we connected immediately. And he um, was at the California Institute of Integral Studies. So I moved out to San Francisco and, and I studied with Stephen for, well, all in total, eight years. But um, going through the kind of curriculum with him, he sort of set up a shedra. He was, uh, so he was very interested uh, Stephen was really trained in the Nyingma tradition. He did his work with Jig, on Jigme Lingpa, and we studied basically Longchenpa and Mipam, and uh, some Kagyu materials and some other kind of philosophical materials, Indic materials for sure. Um, but he, anyways, he had this sort of Shedra program that he sort of designed, and uh, I, I was led through it concurrently taking classes at UC Berkeley, living in Berkeley. So doing the kind of Berkeley thing and being advised by Stephen who lived there in Oakland. And, you know, we we read together Tibetan texts uh, regularly several times a week in, in his uh, third floor of his house. We just go and read for hours and hours and hours. Longchenpa and Mipam and all these guys. And then at the point in my graduate career on the, I guess it was the sixth year of my, doing my PhD, I, I felt like, okay, in order to take this any further, I, I have to go, um, I have to go live with Tibetans. Mm -hmm. And I didn't quite understand what that meant. I was forming my uh, PhD perspective, the kind of um, proposal for the dissertation. And I was going to, I had some ideas and this and that. And then I went to a dinner party with just friends of mine in the hills of San Francisco one evening. And a woman came, an older a woman who I'd not met before was at the dinner party. And she and I started talking and she said, oh, you know, I just came back from India. I was in Dharamsala and this and that. And she said, um, yeah, she found out I'm in graduate school and I study Tibetan Buddhism. And she said, oh, I have this book, you know, but it's in Tibetan and I can't read it. And then she, I said, OK, well, she wanted me to translate it. And I said, OK, yeah, I'm really busy. I can't really translate. I've got to get my PhD stuff. She said, well, I'm going to send it to you. I said, OK. So um, anyways, she sent that book to me uh, within the next few days and just sort of put it aside. But then I went and looked at it. I remember one morning over coffee, I would pulled it off the bookshelf actually in our kitchen, was reading it there. And um, 
I realized that the book was about a tradition of Buddhism that no one had ever studied called mm. the Jayanagi tradition. Mm -hmm. And that it was written by a Lama who had come from Tibet and um, compiled this book. Since I've learned that it was written by multiple people, um, it's kind of a comparative book, a kind of anthology. But the point is that it had this chapter on the history and philosophy of the Jonang. And the history of the philosophy of the Jonang is deeply infused with this idea called Zhentong, which is a view of emptiness that allows for the continuous luminous nature of reality to be uh, validated experientially. And it's a really beautiful vision and kind of view of reality and experience. And I had heard about this. I I was familiar with, you know, I was deeply steeped in, in what we'll call Buddha nature literature and certainly emptiness discourses. Um, but there's very little of it in English. Very, very, very little. And I was, uh, so when I uh, read this book and found out that there's this in Tibetan, I said, wow, this is extraordinary. No one's really studied this. And it's deeply resonant with my interest, philosophical interests. So she said, well, then you have to go to India, uh, where this person, where this Lama is, to meet him. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. Uh, so this and that, different sources of funding from the university, and I think some private funding. And uh, for me as a graduate student, kind of cobbled together. And before you know it, a few weeks later, I was in India in Dharamsala, and I, you know, you go from Delhi up to Dharamsala, I get off the bus, I've been there many times, um, and, um, but this time when I got off the bus, there was uh, a monk there waiting for me, mm -hmm. it wasn't the author of the book, the author of the book had, had left, and uh, was no longer part of the picture, and instead there was this other uh, lama, this other monk standing there, and he greeted me and he welcomed me and um his name is uh, akazangpo uh, tuku zangpo and this is uh, a lama from this tradition from the jonang tradition in eastern tibet in golok in amdo area of uh, which is a cultural domain in far eastern tibet anyways he and i hit it off and we like became best friends and like he basically guided me into this tradition. He could speak English at that time, and my my Tibetan was was pretty good at that time. Spoken Tibetan, but I could, you know, I could read um, pretty well. And we were there, and we would go through the Library of Tibetan Archives and find anything that was on the Jonang tradition, which he, it was his tradition, he knew very well. But then the serendipitous factor was that the Dalai Lama had invited his teacher from Tibet to come to Dharamsala to bestow the Kala Chakra empowerment for his monks in a private setting at the Dalai Lama's private monastery. And the Jonang tradition is specializes in the Kala Chakra Tantra. And the reason for this occasion was that the tradition of the Dalai Lama, the Geluk tradition, did not have the full transmission for the Kala Chakra. It had lost it historically from the 15th century and wanted to renew these lineages. It, the Kala Chakra has been transmitted in multiple streams. Mm -hmm. uh, I can get into that, but just to keep the conversation simple, let's just call them these two tra traditions, two streams or lineages of transmission called the Ra and the Dro, and uh, which not exactly the Geluk and the Jonang, but for the sake of conversation, let's equate them. And anyways, so um, the Dalai Lama had invited this master from Tibet, uh, the senior exemplar of the Jonang tradition and expert in the Kala Chakra, and I was there. And he was the teacher of this Tuku Zangpo, who was, you know, um, my dear friend and guide who I uh, was working with and, 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 and sort of tutor. And so then um, his name is Kempo Sherab, Kempo Kunga Sherab Solji Rinpoche. Kunga, uh, he came from Golok with a small entourage of his monks. 
was hosted by the Dalai Lama there and gave for two weeks, I think. I don't remember exactly, 10, 12, 14 days it was, maybe mm -hmm. uh, more than 10 days, 10, 12. I think the full one is 14 days, 12, 14 days. Um, I just sat there, you know, the sort of white guy in the room <laughs> in this, in the Dalai Lama's private, uh, you know, monastery there in Dharamsala with all these monks that he had selected and to receive these transmissions to sort of pass them on to the, the future generations and um, uh, just sat there and received the full Kala Chakra, empowerments, all these reading transmissions, and the instructions on the practices. And, you know, my, I could read along in the text, and, uh, mm -hmm. although they read very quickly, and I didn't always keep up with it. At that time, I was still pretty, um, still pretty much a newbie um, in that tradition. But anyways, that was that, and it was this deep immersion. And then I traveled with them for several months because then Kempo Sherab wanted to see India. So we did a travel to, together and did pilgrimage. And I had already done pilgrimage in India, so I was very familiar with these places. So I traveled with them for several months. And then at that point, um, you know, I realized I wanted to study this more deeply. And I had to go back and uh, to the United States and finish my prospectus for my dissertation. So I said to Kempo Sherabol, you know, how do I study this more deeply, more intently? Like this, I want this to be my project. Mm -hmm. And I remember we were sitting there and he looked at me and he said, well, nobody in India knows about these things. <laughs> If you want to come, if you want to study this, you have to come to Tibet. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, can I do that? And he just smiled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, and then, you know, that was uh, springtime. And then I went home, you know, back to the... Uh, to, to Berkeley and sort of put my prospectus together, figured out how to get visa. This was in 2004. And that summer I went to Tibet and spent the whole summer mostly on pilgrimage in Kham because other places, Dzogchen and, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, places around Dege and um, uh, Dzogchen Monastery and uh, so forth I wanted to see uh, and then uh, went up to Golok to visit uh, these Jonang monasteries Ngawa and Golok during that trip and uh, it was just kind of making sure that it was okay and you know I familiarizing myself and re you know acquainting with the situation and the landscape then I came home um, <clears throat> and uh, just sort of finished business uh, that I had to do for my degree. And then I moved to Tibet and I lived in Tibet from 2004 to 2008 in a monastery in Golok, which is mm -hmm. a very nomadic remote area of Amdo in northeastern Tibet, far northeastern Tibet. And um, yeah. No one spoke English, not a word except hello, of course. And um, so I was spent sort of those years really immersed in the tradition mm -hmm. and um, the language and the philosophy and the practice and this kind of, you know, trained within uh, with, with these teachers there. And um, anyways, this led to that and... Um, in 2008, I moved back to the United States because there was a man named E. Jean Smith, mm -hmm. who uh, was really the kind of, some say, the sort of uh, grandfather of Tibetan studies in the in the in the sense that he uh, really helped establish the preservation of Tibetan literature and the um, presence of uh, Tibetan books, the archival presence of Tibetan books in libraries in North America. He worked for the Library of 
Congress mm -hmm. in New Delhi, India, and was in charge of a program called the PL 480, which was put forth by the United States Congress and the Indian government. Uh, in exchange for cultural goods from India, the United States would pay uh, India for food, give them food and so forth, um, uh, grains and rice and so forth. So um, at the time, uh, the Tibetans were coming into India. So Jean said, well, cultural goods can mean anything in India. That can mean mm -hmm. these products, called, mm -hmm. which are the books, the texts that the Tibetans are bringing. Anyways, Gene, that was Gene's career. Uh, he's one of the, in my mind, most extraordinary human beings I've ever met uh, as far as a scholar. His um, breadth of knowledge is just astounding. A lion of a scholar. And I had become, I knew him in graduate school through uh, my mentor, Stephen Goodman, who were deep old friends. And anyways, at that time, uh, 2008, Gene, uh, I had been going around Tibet in the summers and traveling, looking for rare texts. That's what Tulku Zongpo then came back to Tibet too. And the two of us um, would travel around looking for rare texts at Jono monasteries, but other places that we would find along the way and, and scanning them, digitizing them, not physically acquiring them, but digitizing them. And then I would let Gene know what these were. And he would send me a list of things to look for. And anyways, we had this kind of relationship. And he said, well, if you want to come back to America, I have a job for you in New York City. And um, I said, OK. So uh, I moved back to New York City to work with Gene Smith in January 2008. And then I worked with Gene until, uh, well, until he died um, mm -hmm. three years later very closely with him in a kind of apprentice <clears throat> type relationship. And I learned a lot from Gene and he was deeply interested in um, history and biography and, and literature. And I learned a lot from him. And um, we then moved the project to Harvard University to be part of the Harvard Library after Gene's passing. So I moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts and was director of research at the Tibetan Buddhist Resource Center, which is this project that Gene had set up to preserve Tibetan literature, and we were archiving it. And uh, I was continuing in the summers to go to Tibet. So I spent three to four months of the year uh, traveling all over Tibet, continuing this search for rare Tibetan manuscripts. Yeah. And I did that for the next nine years, so altogether 12 years. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so that's that's my time in Tibet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's an amazing journey, and we could do another an hour just talking about that. I'm sure. And so yeah. Maybe I'll have to have you back on just to dive into one of those things. But I I do want to get to so you're yeah. in you're studying and you're with all these teachers. And you're, you're in the Kala Chakra with the Dalit, which is just an amazing. <laughs> um, yeah. But then, so you, so you have personal questions that are coming up. So you do have a background in, in, in movement, it sounds like, with your martial arts. And so a lot of your work is around the body and Tibetan uh, som somatic understanding and embodiment with the Tibetans. And I, I feel like this is an area that's really not highlighted and really misunderstood as we're yeah. having this dialogue with the Tibetans. So I think that you are in a really interesting place to help shine some light on that. Yeah, you know, I've come to um, appreciate the orientation that the Tibetan contemplative traditions have to foregrounding bodily experience, somatic embodied experience. Mm -hmm. This is particularly evident in the completion stage practices of Tantra, um, of which there's several models, but arguably most of them, if not all of them, I would argue probably all of them, foreground what I'll call somatic yogas. That is to say, creating conditions or performing exercises that 
build physical endurance and or extend the human body to its thresholds in order to induce ecstatic experiences, bliss infused mm -hmm. experiences. Now, this is a very kind of particular orientation. Mm -hmm. And it's one that comes out of a tradition, not just of the completion stage yogas, but if we look at the whole contemplative program, which is varied and, 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 and I'd rather complexify it than simplify it, but typically you'll go through what's called the preliminary practices, the mundro, the primary practices, um, and, and which are typically the generation and completion stages. And then there's some sort of extended integration practices. And um, when we look at all these different phases, just to kind of put a very, you know, simplistic curriculum uh, model, just for the sake of this conversation, even at the very, very beginning with these prostrations and the mandala and uh, uh, these exercises from the very beginning are very embodied. They're very much uh, kinesthetic practices, practices of movement, practices of um, aligning uh, bodily sense and somatic awareness with these contemplative gestures of transformation. Now, there is a kind of debate here that's long standing. Do you foreground the mind in cognitive capacities or cognitive uh, exercises, mm -hmm. or do you foreground the body? And um, breath work is typically understood as somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. In other words, it can be used to calm the mind, mm -hmm. but other breathing techniques can be used to induce certain ecstatic states, um, or let's say thrilled, if I may, states within the body, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's this typical model, mind, uh, body, speech, and mind, but speech here is breath, right? Body, breath, and mind. And that threefold model you can flip on either side. That is to say, pedagogically in the presentation of different contemplative practices and different traditions see this differently and different teachers probably see this differently individually. Um, you can begin with the mind. Mm -hmm. Begin by using analytical exercises, deconstruction of the self, impermanence, you know, even, you know, watching uh, thoughts unfold in the mind making uh, processes. And that's one whole entirely valid approach for which there's a deep, rich tradition for, which is multifaceted. And there's multiple techniques in uh, involved in that general kind of pedagogical approach. There's another approach that says, well, no, let's foreground the body. Let's put the body first. And that grounds you, that puts you in your body. And that's a system that works with um, the movements of the body, southern, south, uh, subtle or gross movements. So the, the so-called winds, which is not just breath, but energetic movements and postures, gazes, etc. right? There's all kinds of different um, physical exercises you do, positioning you do, um, movements of your eyes, movements of your, of course, your whole body. Um, and it can be quite, um, yeah, quite fully embodied. So again, there's different uh, traditions that say, well, let's begin with that and get you in your body, get you uh, grounded and somaticized, if you will. Um, and then we can start to work with the subtler movements of the mind, the fluctuations of awareness. So both are valid <clears throat> approaches, yeah. kind of teaching pedagogical approaches. However, when we look at what they're really trying to do um, in, within these tantric systems that the Tibetans 
not only inherited, but really refined, innovated mm -hmm. and refined these contemplative systems. And Tibetans deserve extraordinary credit, not just for receiving them from the Indic, uh, their Indic origins, but again, refining, cultivating, innovating. I will use that word innovating. I think it's important. There's novel practices that Tibetans um, introduced and uh, enhanced, extended, etc. And when we look at the tantric systems um, from Indian Buddhism that Tibetans work with and emphasized, the completion stage practices are very much interested and oriented in what I call a somatization process. That is to say, a process in which you are using your body, everything from its physical gestures and movements through to the subtler energetic flows of winds and waters and you know hydraulic systems and within the body and and these kind of wind systems within the body these kind of nuclei nucleic systems within the body etc cetera, etc cetera. the energetic patterns the wheels the channels etc this kind of what i call most people call subtle body i call visceral body because it's not meant to be subtle it is su subtle it's chawe lu in tibetan which literally means subtle body but it's also felt in a visceral sense. Mm -hmm. That's very important that we understand that these are not abstract models of a body, but that they're felt models of a body. Yeah. So visceral. So working with the visceral body um, through these different techniques, what I call somatic yogas, through this process of somatization. And what is that? Well, they're articulated differently within different completion stage yoga systems, different tantras and other completion stage systems. But um, fundamentally, I think it's safe to say that what they're trying to do is transform the body, the physical, gross, blood and flesh body, and also the undercurrents, the subtle, visceral, fluctuating movement-oriented body. And they're trying to align them. They're working, rather, to align them through these various techniques in order to optimize the human being. And um, This isn't necessarily something that's really been articulated very well, I think, within presentations of Buddhist meditation. Um, and I don't uh, think that the Buddhist tantric traditions are been talked about. There's some, you know, there's some things out there. But even um, in scholarly literature, there's not much that has really said, well, what they're really doing here is foregrounding the body and these very kind of uh, ingenuitive yogic processes. To go back pre sort of Tibetan inheritance into this moment of Indian Tantric Buddhism, probably late 8th through 11th century, mid 11th century, we find um, with the emergence of these tantras and how they were really cultivated within tantric communities at that time, that there were several movements, there were several um, moves that these tantric communities, Vajrayana communities in India made. And uh, one of them was to be highly, what we would call interdisciplinary or really kind of eclectic. Mm -hmm. That is to say, they understood the power of knowledge emerges from multiple perspectives, mm -hmm. from multiple expertise. So they were bringing into these communities, these tantric communities, people from medicine with medical training, people from alchemy and what we would call chemistry, people from 
uh, astrology and trying to figure out configurations of astrological systems. They were bringing in people who were doing physical arts, right? Yoga, martial arts, these kind of things. We were very interested in bringing in, um, of course, philosophers and scholars and people who are thinking about these issues all together in these kind of experimental communities and the tantras then recording this material. One of then the outcomes, I would argue, of this kind of tantric experimentation, community, communal experimentation, is a kind of cult of the body, a kind of disposition, if not realization, that if we work with the body, the different flows within the body, different practices that can induce, enhance experiences within the body, sensorial, perceptual, affective, emotional, physical, etc. Those can be translated into the kinds of human organism optimizations that these tantric traditions were interested in. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the body became central. Mm -hmm. And philosophy, which was so predominant in Buddhism up to that point, then became a project of how do we understand doctrinal philosophical understandings such as emptiness and Buddha nature through embodiment, mm -hmm. through experiential practices. That's when these different kinds of yogas were really um, codified. So what am I talking about? Just to be more concrete, of course, we have the famous codification of... Sorry, when was this? You're talking India still. Yeah, now I've sort of backtracked to India, this kind of formative moment of uh, sort of pre-inheritance of tantric Buddhism into Tibet. And when the codification of these completion stage yogas or completion stage contemplative practices were, so the six teachings of Naropa, six teachings of Naguma, of course, the completion stages of all these different tantras, whether it be Gyo Samaja, Kala Chakra, you know, Sadanga Yoga, Sixfold Yogas, etc. There's multiple completion stage systems, all um, curtailed and customized slightly differently according to the tantras um, that they're embedded in or the broader tantric uh, frameworks of which they're, they're embedded in. But all of them uh, body-centric all of them interested in foregrounding um, somatic yogas. And did this start like right at the beginning, like the 8th century with Sadaha, or did you were talking moving back towards like 10th, 11th, 12th century, or was this kind of there from the beginning of the Mahamudra? Are we talking Mahamudra tradition here? Mahamudra was one of many traditions oh. um, that developed, you know, during this period. And and, um, you know, the different formulations of these tantras all sort of coalesced within this, you know, several hundred years. The sort of last uh, moment, uh, sort of apex, if you will, was the Kala Chakra Tantra, which is the last great tantra to be codified in Sanskrit and in India and passed through Kashmir into Tibet. And, of course, then the 17 tantras of the Dzogchen system, again, 11th century, codified in this time period, um, probably not written by Indians as well, as far as we know. We have no Sanskrit of that. It was written by Tibetans. But nonetheless, um, by the 11th century, Tibetans were part of the project. They okay. were, they were, you know, they were uh, more than ancillary to the milieu. They were, um, they were partners in the project. Mm -hmm. um, and so that sort of moment of 11th, certainly by mid 11th uh, century, uh, we have some of these materials in particular, of course, Skiya Samaja, the six fold, uh, six uh, 
teachings of Naropa and six teachings of Naguma, the 17 tantras of Dzogchen, the Kala Chakra Tantra. These are the kind of monumental tantric systems that 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 had profound impact in shaping uh, contemplative discourse and practice and experience in Tibet. And you're saying all of these generally were leaning, they were body centric or, or, um, yeah. or grounding the body. Yeah, and you know the Dzogchen material is very interesting. People may think, "What are you talking about? Dzogchen is all about awareness and this and that." When we read this early material, which I've been doing mm -hmm. with some of my colleagues here, um, there are incredible, like absolutely astoundingly um, rich practices of sensory engagement. Mm -hmm. what we'll call sensorial practices within these tantras, Dzogchen tantras. And they're deeply interested in um, embodiment through the senses and what we'll call sense-making contemplations. Mm -hmm. And um, that doesn't get, you know, later, the, the later tradition does not emphasize these as much. In fact, there's a famous, I mean, famous in my mind, I don't know how famous it is, uh, Jigme Lingpa, in his um, the famous text of Yeshi Lama, he has um, a phrase where he's basically he he gives a nod to these elemental sensorial practices where you're working with the body and the physical elements, and he says, "Yeah, they're beautiful, but nobody practices those anymore." Mm -hmm. And then he shifts um, and talks about other things. So there's even acknowledgement within the tradition that a lot of these practices were, um, you know, were, were not kept up. And that's the thing about the Tibetan tradition. It's just, it's vast and it's, um, and it's deep and it's complex. And um, I think oftentimes we, as people situated in this moment in time, whether we're scholars or practitioners, think of the tradition that we receive either through our teachers or through books in English as the received tr tradition. And therefore that's sort of what Dzogchen is or what Mahamudra is or what the Kala Chakra is. When in fact, when we look and read the materials from these traditions, when we read the Tibetan archive, um, which is just, again, so rich and deep, that uh, we're continually rediscovering and, and um, understanding how just entangled and complex um, these traditions were. And then choices were made by certain persons along the course of history, certain scholars and representatives, exemplars of these traditions, of all the traditions, uh, about what to select and what to emphasize, and what to write about, and what to teach. And consequently, that selective process has sort of left things behind or mm -hmm. re-emphasized um, uh, the importance of some practices and so forth, and that's all natural. And yet, um, just to you know, re-emphasize, I think it's really important for us as uh, inheritors or receivers of the tradition as scholars, as practitioners, to recognize that what we have is is really just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I get I always get the sense so like for one thing you're using this word embodiment. I don't know if they have a counter to this. You're just sort of seeing these practices and you're sort of putting it under this heading because I don't think it's that explicit from what I've heard. And then it also like there's also this bit that. A lot of this is kind of behind closed doors a little bit, like if you're practicing and, and I, that kind of makes sense as a like you live there and but like we know the way the body practices are typically disseminated in the East. You have a student teacher relationship and you just follow and mm -hmm. sort of gather these practices through experience. It's not really through like reading so much. It's like seeing them do it and being told yes. it. I mean, that's kind of how movement works, right? A dance or something. It's not, you can read, but it's about being in the room with the teacher. Very much. Following along. So is that a bit why this stuff is 
still lagging behind as far as like when we get the, the transmission? That's a very good point. Um, I don't think for all the practices, but certainly what uh, the Tibetan yogic exercises, what get called Lujong or Trulkor, sometimes Tsalung, these kind of yogic <clears throat> exercises, which um, uh, different contemplative traditions in Tibet have different formulations of them, just like if we look at the Indian record of yoga, um, they are written down, but yet again, yes, to your point, decoding what they mean as uh, movements uh, is very much, yes, a living trans uh, transmission. And it's very important to be with people who understand these practices and can teach them to you in person. I, um, you know, so I, I study the Kala Chakra tradition as one of the traditions I study. And um, there is a formula, there's a, a whole set of yogas uh, for physical yoga for um, from the Kala Chakra tradition. And some of these, uh, when I read the text, you know, it's it's completely cryptic what it's saying. And I fortunately have um, Tibetan teachers who I, I can ask and, and they can show me. Um, but without that, yes, it's very difficult uh, to understand these particular uh, movements. Uh, so yes, actually in-person transmission and, and just demonstration is very important. Not all practices are like that, though. Let's, um, there's many practices that we have in the descriptive archive, right? We have descriptions of, prescriptions of in the literature that we can read and, and make, you know, make sense of. We can translate and understand what they're doing. And in mm -hmm. fact, the majority of practices are like that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So um, can I ask, you don't have to answer this, but so when you were getting the transmission, in these readings with the Dalai Lama for these two weeks, was there any phys physical practices involved? No, that was not. There was no, there was no uh, introduction to, to the Kala Chakra Tibetan Yogas during that time. I've, I've worked with Tibetan teachers on these uh, in other circumstances since, but no, that wasn't part of it. Um, those teachings were, it was sort of that, so I've, you know, I, I've received these now several times from my teachers, um, but that particular occasion was very much about a historical transmission to these gay Luke lamas who um, just had their tradition had lost the um, had lost the string, you could say, um, and that this was sort of retying it to, to bring back continuity. So that occasion was very much about making sure that um, it was complete and whole and that they had received everything they needed. It wasn't about nuance and detail of the practices themselves, that particular occasion. Um, can, so can we talk a little bit about you? you... You had said of the imagination in the body. Yeah, to, please. To like dream and, and tumo. Sure. So, you know, I'm writing this book now, um, slowly, but nonetheless. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Uh, and which it's it's currently organized. I, you know, so I just finished my book on the Jonang, which is now um, under review and in process. And this book I'm working on now, which I turn my attention to, is uh, organized towards three kind of sections. One is practices of attention. And I mean that very broadly construed, which will include capacities of mindfulness and meta-awareness and awareness of awareness. So attentional practices, awareness practices, we could call them. Then the second um, are practices of the imagination, imaginal practices, and that involves, uh, yes, visualizations, but also simulations and performative simulation practices, and then dream yoga practices are all part of the active imagination. Yeah. And then embodied practices, which involve everything from chud or this kind of body, um, severance practice uh, to uh, practices of uh, these Tibetan yogas, 
but also practices of, uh, you know, I think I'll have probably a chapter on, you know, actually leaving the body and uh, sort of sense of disembodiment and so on and so forth. And, and then uh, the sort of primacy of the body. So attention, imagination, and embodiment. And the, they're only deciphered for the sake of organizing knowledge, right? But when we look at practices of um, imagination and practices of embodiment, there's, um, there's great congruence and uh, there's this oscillation back and forth of how you are imagining your body and how you are feeling your body. So the visceral body, the imaginal body, again, a kind of oscillation back and forth. Mm -hmm. This becomes particularly prominent in several practices, deity yoga, of course, um, illusory form practices, but then also in dream yoga, which is related to illusory form as a nighttime practice. And surprisingly, I've been reading dream yoga manuals for the last two years now. I have a scientific collaboration studying dream yoga with um, partners at Northwestern University, where they have a sleep lab and we're studying people who um, are capable of performing dream yoga, which is essentially lucid dreaming. Mm -hmm. uh, but while you're lucid dreaming, you're performing these contemplative mm -hmm. techniques or tasks which are very specific and, and, and prescribed within these manuals. But one of the things I've discovered in reading and trying to understand this dream yoga literature from different Tibetan traditions is um, how they have, again, foregrounded the body. Mm -hmm. Again and again and again, they are talking, prescribing, describing experiences and what to do with your body while in a dream. Hmm. So called Nilam Kilu, um, which is uh, literally the dream body. And how do you perform in a dream body, right? Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting. They have whole sections, typical, have a whole section on training in becoming a dream body or training your body in a dream or these mm -hmm. kinds of practices where embodiment <clears throat> in the dream is clearly very important and um, what it means to identify as a self and recognize one being in a body right mm -hmm. seeing yourself looking at your hands looking recognizing yourself not necessarily a mirror or anything we recognize ourselves as being ourself in a dream which is very interesting this kind of implicit reflexivity here right and then what's interesting about some of these practices, there's many interesting components, but one of them is that you are in your dream body um, performing certain tasks. And one of these tasks is to transform your body into different bodies. So you can, there's two fundamental tasks or gestures. One is, you shift into another body. So you see somebody and then you become that person and that person becomes you. So exchanging bodies mm -hmm. and then exchanging back. And the other is shape-shifting your own body to become a completely different identity, right? A man becomes a woman, a woman becomes a man, a tall person becomes a short person, a short person becomes a tall person, a fat person becomes a skinny person, skinny person becomes a fat person, endless kind of configurations of the shape-shifting of embodiment. And what they're doing, at least what I'm sort of beginning to postulate and put forth is that um, our sense of being in a body is so deeply entrenched with our sense of identity and sense of self that if we can, within these virtual environments of a dream, the dream world, and the basic structure is there's a dream world, you enter into the dream, you're in a dream world, the dreamscape, landscape, and that within that dream landscape is the dream body. 
And then within the dream body, you can navigate the dream world or the landscape of the dream, of which there's other objects, other dream bodies, etc. So if we can, through these intentional contemplative techniques in the dream world, transform the shape, the sense, the movement of the dream body, we can begin to work with, loosen up, cultivate more pliability and flexibility of our identity in a body. Mm -hmm. It's very, very interesting because they are these practices that is are very interested. Um, one of the somatic practices that they're most interested in again and again recurrently is movements of the body. And they say, if you move habitually, you're a fast walker mm -hmm. in life, in waking life, then walk slow. Mm. If you take long strides, take short strides. Mm -hmm. If you and your daily pathways, say you're walking to work or walking to school or walking in certain habitual pathways, um, uh, walk in a straight line, then zigzag as you walk yeah. in your dream. Oh, in the, so this is in the dream, yeah. In your dream, right? Or if while you're waking, you have pathways that have curves or some kind of turns, then in your dream, walk straight, mm -hmm. right? So what they're saying implicitly, of course, we get this just from understanding kind of Buddhist contemplative theory, is that the body somatic awareness holds habitual movements. Mm -hmm. And the more those movements are habitualized by repeating them, by reifying those patterns, the more we walk straight, the more we walk straight. To the extent we can use virtual bodies and virtual worlds to transform those habit patterns is to the extent, and this is the interesting part, that when we wake up, mm -hmm. we have re-taught, re-habitualized, incrementally as we do it overnight and night and dream mm -hmm. and dream what the bodily somatic habits are mm -hmm. and they do the same of course with perceptual and cognitive patterns and habits but they're very interested in these bodily habits and they'll do it again through these various techniques primary or at least uh, recurrent are how you move your body mm -hmm. now they take that further of course we can do things in the dream we cannot do while we're awake not mm -hmm. only walk in zigzags which we can do if, when we're awake if we choose but we can walk very fast yeah. in fact we can walk much faster than we can often when we're awake mm -hmm. but then we can jump extraordinary distances extraordinary lengths extraordinary heights and then we can fly. Mm -hmm. So all of these are intentional gestures of the body, somatic movements that these traditions suggest if we become acutely aware of performing in these ways while lucid, wakeful, mm -hmm. in dream, that translate those gestures, those movements of embodiment translate into waking body experience, embodied experiences. Well, that's perfect. very interesting. And um, this is the kind of, uh, yeah, this is one of the sort of top of mind projects for me this day, these days. And um, I'm starting now to work with virtual reality and what that might mean for, um, simulating similar kinds of contemplative experiences and we'll continue to work with dream 
there's also um, a whole set of daytime practices that um, are very interesting that I'm that I'm working with and translating and so forth. So all of these uh, aren't entirely body embodied practices. Uh, I don't mean to suggest that, but they do have this kind of core component of an emphasis yeah. on how we work with and in their language, uh, lujung, train the body. Mm -hmm. Well, you said that it oscillates between the intention, imagination, and the body. So right. So that's the other thing is you're imagining your body in different ways, um, and that's to simulate a felt, visceral sense of your body being different. Mm -hmm. And so these are all, yeah. No, I mean, methods. Yeah, it's fast. It's fa completely fascinating. Um, and we we find different practices like this, Western somatics, in China, Tai Chi, and Qigong, Taoyin. Uh, but the I don't the the dreaming thing seems to make perfect sense because at night you're you are your consciousness is still running, and so much of our habits just fighting with it during the day to have that edge of six to eight hours at night when the body's relaxed, because because a lot of this is nervous system patterns. Yeah. And so if you can work on that level at nighttime, your body's in a position to take more on when during the day, you're still trying to hold yourself up. You're, you, you're literally engaged in your patterns just to be upright in the gravitational field. Yeah. That's, that's and, and just, you know, I mean, philosophically, if you will, for a moment, the, this kind of mind body dualism that has become so prevalent and, um, scientific discourse in, in, in the last few centuries is just predominant. I think the Cartesian paradigm is sort of something we're born into, thinking that mind is body and are separate. And these practices, just these simple practices that I'm describing now, um, suggest something utterly different, a worldview that doesn't even acknowledge that as the possibility that you can actually through entirely being asleep with your body, as you say, resting still in the bed, transform your body through working with the mind during dream and your dream body. So, you know, it's there are radical different orientations that these traditions have, and it's very important to under to approach them and recognize some of the biases or preconceptions that we may bring to them. And then what are they actually telling us? What kind of knowledge do they have that's implicit in the description of the process? So this is the core of what I'm really interested in is what are the underlying dynamics, processes, mechanisms of these practices? What are the kind of implicit processes that they have discovered and articulated are transformative? How do they work? That's what I'm interested in. How does meditation work? I'm, I'm exactly the same. That's exactly what I'm interested in. And I've, you know, because I started out along, like asking the question, like, well, what's the difference between the the understanding of the body from this tradition or from a Western disembodied materialistic tradition? And it's it's almost like you you can't even make this comparison. Like right. you got to back up further. It's the question is wrong. If you if you if you ask that question, you're you're not going to get a satisfying answer or get to somewhere you can work with. I really have appreciate the way you you put this so eloquently today with the foregrounding of the body or the foregrounding of the mind. It gives us space within which to work, and then we don't try to grab it because we always, you know, we still are think we we might be interested in their perception of the body, but because we're holding on to this strong materialistic view, we we really can't. We're in our own way, sort of, because we think, oh, are they doing some sort of running or lifting weights or some sort of exercise? Yes, from that we're familiar with this, like you, you're not. That's not maybe the right that that very view is preventing you from really seeing what they mean by embodiment. Yeah, 
So thank you. That I completely agree with that. My approach and it's, you know, a training that I've I've had to undergo is but to approach these traditions and, and reading these these texts and these traditions and receiving them and understanding and interpreting them with a kind of deep curiosity, always querying and curious, what does that mean? How does that work? And not taking anything either at face value or when any of my own kind of implicit biases or presumptions I find or become cognizant of coming to bear, really just kind of backtracking, being like, whoa, actually, is that what they mean? Is that what they're saying? And then when I get to a point of kind of comfort of like, ah, yeah, okay, I understand what's happening here. I understand what they're saying to me. I understand what the text is saying to me or the, the teacher is saying to me. And then I look for analogs. Where in our culture, where in our paradigms of popularity, of mass consumption, do we find analogs? Not identical, that's the slip thing where you say, oh, this is that. I'm not, I don't, I'm very careful not to make equivalences, but analogs. Well, mm -hmm. this is kind of like sports in this way to, you know, build on your analogy, or this is kind of like, you know, cooking in this way and so on and so forth. In other words, I think part of what I'm, become very sensitive to as a translator of these traditions is how important it is to both, yes, understand what they're saying without trying to interpret it based on my own lens, although I understand that's inherent to the process, but really let them speak to me. And once then I feel comfortable, have some comfort level with understanding what the tradition is saying, frame it in a way that makes sense in contemporary parlance. Mm -hmm. This is really kind of the work I'm very much engaged in now, boiling down kind of discrete units, what we call elements um, of these practices and trying to describe them in contemporary parlance. And that means not just English, but language that's philosophically refined to contemporary uh, discourses, scientifically uh, resonant with contemporary discourses, and so on and so forth. So I'm very interested in also on the other side, what are the, what is the language of the, the, the health sciences or cultural psychology or philosophy, et cetera, these, the arts, technology, contemporary discourses that make sense in this translation project of these Tibetan texts over the last thousand years. And I feel like that's part of this broader translation project that isn't just kind of words, but um, the meaning and the sense of a kind of cultural translation. So the people who aren't necessarily Buddhist practitioners necessarily, all but also certainly who are, <laughs> um, can make sense of this and say, oh, yeah, okay, I get that. I see that analog and that's a different kind of approach or there's nuance here and so forth. So um, anyways, this is the kind of interdisciplinary appreciation that I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. doing here. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, thank you. We're, I can tell you just, just we really care about this and you've spent a lot of time in this. I, I really appreciate your uh, your work, but also coming on the show and sharing this with us. And, thank um, you, Bryson, for having me. It's been a total pleasure. May I mention one thing, a little plug? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. Because it, it it's relevant to um, the people of somatic uh, practice. And I would love to put on and have sort of been in conversation with, with colleagues, fellow practitioners and scholars and scientists about um, a conference on Tibetan yoga. Mm -hmm. And I think we are now at a moment in time historically where these traditions are both endangered 
and in danger of being misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And I would love to pull people together, um, again, practitioners, scholars, uh, scientists, etc., in dialogue. That's one of the things I've been doing over the course of the last eight years or so is curating different interdisciplinary dialogues. And I'd love to have something like that, a kind of uh, symposium dialogue on Tibetan yoga practices. So if people are listening and have an interest in supporting that in whatever capacity, please feel free to reach out. And that's that's excellent. And um, I'm, I'm very interested in that as well. And I think you're right. I think it's timely and necessary for all the reasons you said. What, what a pleasure to meet you. Thanks, Bryce. And I appreciate you reaching out and the invitation. It's a pleasure to to talk with you. Thank you so much for all the work you do.